Hello and welcome to Russians with Attitude. Today we are gonna talk about Vasily Rozanov, great Russian philosopher, Christian thinker and a heretic, anti-Semite and Judeophile, cozy family man and immoral pornographer, snide publicist and starving philosopher. If Leontiev was 100% male, then Rozanov was a pan-gender god-sexual. His writing stood out. It was full of enchanting music. His ideas were shocking to his contemporaries and forgotten or rather erased in the Soviet Union. Rozanov was born in 1856, the same year Freud was born. This is not the only coincidence, because uh, some people even call Rosanov the Russian Freud, although it's only because not that many Russian philosophers touched upon topics of sex, libido, and their connection to the divine archetypes. Anna Akhmatova, a famous Russian poetess, once said, I love Rosanov when he doesn't talk about Jews or sex. And someone replied, this is all Rozanov ever talks about. White emigrees try to preserve Rozanov's heritage. Dmitry Galkovsky was inspired by him. Being the same little mustachioid Russian man with a galaxy brain while being misunderstood by everyone. In that period of his life he wrote his main book The Endless Deadlock that revolves around the genius of Rozanov although, in my opinion, it fails to capture his mystical nature. As Rosanov himself wrote, there is no me outside of God. But still, Galkovsky made all he could to revitalize Russian interest in Vasily Vasilievich. In this podcast, we will gonna make a comprehensive study of Rosanov's life and ideas. To put it simply for you, Twitter heads, Rozanov is a mix of uh, Chesterton, Hesperic and Elliot Roger. He's cozy, he's wrapped in a blanket, devouring tasty cabbage soup, he's constantly pitying himself and being more emotional than 100 women on their period, and he constantly wants to impregnate women with his little baby carrot. Actually, I just checked what is available on Rozanov in English, and it's almost nothing. So we will make a great work honoring his name and his memory. So let's start with his biography. Rozanov was born in 1856. He grew up in a petit bourgeois family. After his uh, father died uh, quite early, he uh, went to live with his mother's family in Kastrama, uh, which is also where he went to school. And then he moved to Simbirsk, where Lenin also grew up a bit later. He had a literary and an academic career, was a great student of history, philology. Um, this is a not very well-known aspect of his uh, works, actually, but uh, he was a great classicist. He composed the first translation of Aristotle's Metaphysics in Russian. A very uh, good translation, I would say. It's uh, one I would still recommend to any Russian uh, student of Aristotle. Then, in 1882, he uh, finished his university exams. He was a school teacher for some time, and he started um, writing articles in uh, the press. So, in the Ruski Vesnik or Ruske Bazrenie. And then, of course, the famous, uh, most important conservative newspaper of Russia, Nove Vreme, New Time, uh, which was uh, kind of his life's work uh, writing in the Nove Vreme, together with his uh, friend Mikhail Menchikov, uh, about whom I think we should also make an episode in the Russian Thinkers series. But anyway, he was uh, still a school teacher for a long time. Yes, and around that time he married a uh, 40-year-old Milf, who was uh, dating previously Dostoevsky when she was young. And uh, it was the greatest mistake of his life, because soon enough uh, he discovered that, uh, that Milf was uh, despotic and uh, he didn't like to be with her, but she didn't accept uh, divorce. So, to the end of his life uh, he was legally married to this uh, witch. 
Yes, she was uh, very dominant and, uh, well, she was quite a bit older than him. Um, she was very sadistic towards him, so there was kind of a humiliation that Fetish, went through right. uh, yeah, a large part of Rosanov's life. Um, he had a very um, schizophrenic attitude to women most of his life uh, as a result of this marriage, I think. And naturally to Jews as well, because it's the same thing. Right. Is it connected? His work, his first big work, the legend of great inquisitor? Yes, of course. Uh, Rosanov held himself as living in Dostoevsky's shadow, quite literally, actually, since uh, he, uh, well, married his widow. And, uh, of course, uh, his first big literary work was the a book about the legend of the Inquisitor by Dostoevsky, and it uh, got him some attention. His work on Dostoevsky influenced uh, actually um, a large part of uh, the Silver Age um, thinkers like Birdyaev and Bulgakov, by which I mean Sergei Bulgakov, not the writer. He uh, got his first uh, taste of uh, reputation in the literary scene. He began hanging out with Merishkovsky and Gipius and Minsky and so on and kind of became a part of the literary establishment but at the same time he never was a full part of the literary establishment which is kind of a theme throughout his whole life that he never was part of any scene or clique or milieu he was always kind of an outsider he had a foot in the door everywhere but uh, he was never fully accepted anywhere right so soon enough, when he left former wife of Dostoevsky, he in secret uh, was married to a wife with whom he gave birth to four kids, I think. And uh, family life and became an important topic of his. The miracle of birth, the just domesticity. He once said, why does Christianity say all these terrible serious things when i just want to sleep with my wife make babies and eat cabbage soup yes i think the cabbage soup is a great symbol of uh, rosanov's artistic logic as a writer um, he had always this chestertonian streak of domesticity one example is i think that i think it's his most famous quote it's, um, you know, uh, Chernyshevsky, the proto-revolutionary, wrote this novel, What is to be done? Что делать? And uh, Rosanov wrote an aphorism about it, and uh, he said that, What is to be done? asked an impatient St. Petersburg youth. Well, if it's summertime, what you've got to do is wash berries and make jam. And if it's winter, what you've got to do is drink tea with this jam. Which is actually a lot deeper than um, it might seem on first glance. The small things in life, domesticity, the family, uh, this was precisely what was uh, arousing love and pity in Rosanov's work. And in total, it was precisely those small things which uh, he loved, and especially two small things in Rosanov's view. God gave his blessing and uh, loved them specifically. And uh, what is important is that Rosanov considered himself to be among those small things. So he was a person of great humility. And man on earth, uh, in general, was a small thing. And I think it is this uh, tendency in his thinking and in his style that uh, made him stand out against the very loud and very proud and prideful literature of the period. Um, for example, like you have Gorky saying that человек, это звучит гордо. The word man rings of pride. And Rosanov was against pride. He was uh, for humility. And there is a beautiful passage in uh, one of his works that uh, is also very famous. And I think it captures his literary spirit and his, I think, his theology overall. There is much that is beautiful in Russia. October 17th. The Constitution, Ivan Pavlovich asleep, but best of all is to go out on a clear Monday and choose pickles at Zaitsev's on the corner of Sadovaya, red whortleberries all laid out on plates for tasting, and huge Spanish onions, and enormous cabbages, 
and strings of white mushrooms strewn on the door post, milk agraric ones, and above the door an icon of the Savior be the lamp burning in front of it. It's the essence of orthodoxy. There is a kind of contrast that you can see between Rosanov style and the later Soviet style of socialist realism. Rosanov was no realist as a writer, uh, no more than he was a huge lover of food or whatever. But uh, what is interesting about this is that we have here not a description, right, of uh, uh, some gourmet stuff or whatever, but it's the creation of a materially felt picture, of a literal picture. And Rosanov was very much possessed by this feeling of uh, spe very specific things. He had a very strong feeling for the concrete, despite his uh, distance from the concepts of uh, literary realism. So this is uh, reflected, I think, in the accuracy of names. So this isn't just some mushroom stall, right? It is Zaitsev's. And it's not uh, somewhere in Nibesne uh, Belovodye. It's right there on the corner of Sadovoy and Nevsky. And uh, he described it uh, just as if uh, we had been like running down the street and we just wanted to buy some mushrooms there. And it is this feeling of familiarity that uh, evokes so strong emotions in the reader of Rosanov. He always makes you feel like you are literally right there taking part in his life. And this is what he achieves by using this very familiar style. Yes, especially if we are to compare to another great domestic thinker of our time, Richard Spencer, and his famous quote, <laughs> I've had some good burgers in my life. I love a good melted Swiss cheese and mushrooms, roasted mushrooms and caramelized onions on a burger. That is hot stuff. You can get that at a number of different places. Just uh, think that Rosanov just lays it out where can you get huge Spanish uh, onions and uh, amazing cabbages? But Spencer keeps it a secret. Can you? <laughs> okay, so let's talk about the really hot topic. In Russia Wikipedia, it just says school of thought anti Semitism, <laughs> <laughs> which is weird because there are no proofs to back it up. Almost, almost no. I think that his attitude to Jews, it was way milder than the attitude of a regular Russian person. But it was on the nose, as it were. He was preoccupied with an idea of a little man, which he also considered himself to be. And the little Jewish man stumbling on the street, uh, dressed uh, up all weird, hated by everyone. It made Rosnov feel compassion to him. But when Jews were united in some organization or powerful movement, he immediately resented them because of his desire for justice, justice for little people. But it was enough to put him into anti-Semitic camp. So let's talk about his attitude to Jews. I think in a way, Rosanov's attitude towards the Jews is a mirror of uh, Nietzsche, who also um, was at his core anti-Semite in some ways, right? But at the same time, he kind of admired the Jews for their, I don't know how to put it, vitalism maybe for their vitalism, for their uh, intimacy with life. And I think this is the same thing that Rosanov saw in them, that he wanted to, uh, you know, uh, Nietzsche had uh, this weird passage about how the future European aristocracy can only be achieved if you like breed uh, Nordic Europeans with Jews to create a new master race. And uh, it's kind of what Rosanov also said, but not in terms of race, but in terms of religion, culture, and so on. So the spiritual side. But, um, he thinks that, uh, or at least at times he thought that, because at other times he said uh, very much uh, not so flattering things about Jews. I think there was some kind of admiration for the Jews uh, because they stick together, right? Um, uh, and the Russians never did. 
it's, it's kind of a cliche. It is widely used uh, among Slavophiles uh, in Russia and it was used abroad about how the Russians are collectivistic and we have natural socialism or whatever, but that is not true. That has never been true. The Russian peasant has always been like an uncap and uh, Rosanov uh, said himself about Russia, Russia feels as much pity for a man as a train feels pity for the man it ran over. There is no point in shouting in Russia. No one will hear. And I think it's this sticking together uh, among the diaspora Jews that uh, Rosanov very much admired and wanted to have for the Russians as well. But of course he understood that it's not like some isolated thing that uh, you just have uh, ethnic uh, solidarity, but it's mixed with uh, certain religious and cultural things that have to accompany this, to create this. And this is what uh, lay at the core of his um, attitude towards the Jews, because what they were doing, uh, it was great for them, but it was kind of not so great for like the rest of the country. This is where the schizophrenia comes from with regards to the Jews, I think. Right. I mean, the main thing why Rosanov was uh, put in the anti-Semite camp uh, was probably uh, his position on the Bailey's case, after all. The Bailey's case, it was, um, well, in 1911, um, in Kiev, a young boy was murdered and his, uh, he was found naked with like 50 stab wounds. The locals decided that it was a ritual murder by Jews. So kind of the whole blood libel thing, you know, um, about Jews ritualistically murdering Christian boys, drinking their blood, whatever, um, which is a staple of anti-Semitic propaganda. And Rosanov, he wrote um, several articles about this case. And uh, what he said is that uh, while he doesn't know specifically whether it is true in this case, but it's certainly possible it would fit in the Jewish worldview to do such a thing is what he said, and um, which, of course, uh, it was kind of a culture war thing in Russia at that time, the Bailey's case, and absolutely uh, separate from the question whether actually the, the Jews they accused were guilty or not. It became this huge political divide where basically if you were uh, a liberal, a socialist, a revolutionary, you were pro Bailey's, and if you were a conservative or a patriot or a monarchist, you were anti baileys So you believe that Baileys was the murderer. And um, it's, uh, it's became, uh, as these things often do, it was not about the murder itself. It was about a whole bunch of political questions. And Rosanov, he stood on the wrong side. He uh, supported uh, the Black Hundreds in this uh, specific case and uh, which made him a pariah basically in the liberal cultural establishment and of course 90% of the uh, literary and cultural establishment in Russia was very liberal at that time already and uh, he was forced to leave the uh, religious philosophical society because of his position on the Bailey's case and basically everyone, all the liberals started hating him. Uh, I think people even in Russia don't realize how liberal late 19th century and early 20th century Russia was. Bailey's uh, case ended with uh, his acquittal. He went uh, to America and then died there in New York. Okay, so some philosemitic Quotes of Rosanov, of late Rosanov. Jews are the most refined people in Europe. It was only through stupidity and naivety that they stuck to the flat bottom of the revolution. When their place is completely different, it's at the foot of the power. I let you live, Jews. I bless you in everything. As there was a time when I cursed you in everything. In fact, of course you have the Zimes of the world history, that is, there is such a grain of the world, which is what you have preserved alone. Live by it, and I believe all nations will be blessed for them. 
I do not believe in the enmity of the Jews to all nations at all. I have often observed the amazing, zealous love of the Jews for the Russian people and for our land. Blessed be the Jew, and may the Russian be blessed too. Yes, I think what is important here is that uh, Rosanov was a man who was always in favor of the weak. Uh, he never like punched down, right? And I think that explains his paradoxical attitude towards the Jews. As a philosopher, he was always on the side of the weak and the oppressed. And uh, this could change from situation to situation. And when the Jews were attacking Russia, he defended Russia against the Jews. And when Russia attacked the Jews, he defended the Jews. I believe that this is the, like the solution to the paradox of Rosanov's uh, views on the Jews. Let's um, jump to more interesting stuff. In the beginning, I mentioned that some people uh, compare Rosanov and Freud uh, in their interest uh, in the uh, sexual side of life. But Rosanov was brave enough or too self-assured enough uh, to make some statements that go against the scripture or against the orthodox dogma. So let's talk about that. Yes, uh, he did. He had uh, very scandalous views. Um, I think that's also an interesting contrast, actually, because he was a very, like, um, maybe boring, even um, a very calm person in his private life. Like he was a family father with four children and a very loyal and good husband and so on. But he wrote very scandalous things on sexuality. Um, it is probably uh, the result of uh, the sexual repression he suffered in his first marriage and uh, the humiliation he endured. So he tried to kind of break out. So he wrote uh, about the question of fertility and how fertility is the most important thing in any religion and how the church so, should celebrate um, the marriage, the consummation of marriage uh, way more than it does. And he even um, suggested uh, things like having the married couple, the newlyweds, consummate their marriage inside the church. So, which was of course a very scandalous thing to propose and uh, made uh, him quite unpopular among many more conservative-minded religious um, people. His metaphysics in this way was very uh, centered on questions of sex and gender. Also, he quite angered other Orthodox uh, conservatives uh, by likening animals and uh, animal kingdom, creation of uh, butterflies from caterpillars as uh, some sort of resurrection, that butterfly is the soul. So this pantheistic thinking he was never ashamed of, and that insects live in paradise and gods are their nectar, stuff like that. I don't think he was a pantheist at all. I think that is uh, the wrong term for that. He always believed in a very, in a very personal God. Like, um, I think that was the main thing in his theology that any person should have a deeply personal and intimate relationship with God and, uh, not with the world. <clears throat> and he think, personally uh, decides, uh, what's, uh, important for him from the scripture. Uh, and to him, one of his quotes, uh, you must be loyal uh, in love and to your friends and all other commandments you can just forget. And is this uh, the result of his uh, personal God idea? Yes, yes, I think so. Because for, uh, well, what Rosanov believed was that all other religions were individual, but Christianity was personal. And he made a huge divide in this. Because uh, to him, it was up to each person to, to choose, uh, that is to exercise freedom. And not in the sense of like uh, believing in specific dogma or confession or whatever, uh, because this issue uh, had been decided, right? In the creation of the church uh, after Christ's crucifixion and resurrection. But in the sense of uh, rootedness in the common faith. And Rosanov was, uh, he thought that this process of uh, 
becoming involved in the church it cannot take place uh, just by just you know m mechanically through passive reception of the sacrament and there has to be active faith there must be works so kind of a protestant view in some ways this means that the relationship to god and to the church is determined by one's private conscience and the uh, conscience is what distinguishes in every man the subjective and the objective and it is the difference between the individual and the personal the essential the primary and the secondary and uh, he said that it is necessary to distinguish uh, when discussing conscience two sides the relation of conscience to god and the relation of conscience to the church because god according to christian doctrine is a personally infinite spirit he is uh, and everyone will realize at the first glance that the relation to a person is completely different from the relation to an order or a system of things and uh, no one will say that the church is personal like uh, on the contrary the person inside the church every hierarch is subordinated to a certain um, general order or system and therefore there can be no personal deeply personal relationship to the church as opposed to god so i think that would be the main thing uh, in his theological thinking and his probably his most heretical thing too right one more point that makes him uh, sort of anti-nietzschean is um, his belief that the collective is always more important than the most brilliant of uh, individual in a lot yes, of absolutely and and this is exactly uh, what uh, you were talking about earlier with the small man and the smallness of man in general what uh, a quote of his i also always liked was um that the only worthy monument for a man is an earthen grave and a wooden cross and a golden monument can only be placed above a dog's grave but not above a human person the humility and the smallness of man is exactly what distinguishes him from the rest of creation and uh, that he is capable of humility whereas other uh, creatures are not and uh, it is also what he said this feeling of smallness right this uh, existentialism basically basically rosanas view was a kind of proto existentialism and he said that the essence of prayer the essence of the relationship to god it consists in the acknowledgement of uh, one's helplessness of one's limitations of one's smallness and uh, what he said is that prayer is where i cannot but where i can there is no prayer and this is uh, because of this he believed that the whole um, humanist human-centered traditions like liberalism marxism whatever they were perverting the human spirit because they um, enthroned man above everything else and he believed that this was completely wrong and it would destroy humanity he always uh, tried to make a lot of uh, different perspectives and uh, try to look at uh, something through eyes of other men and that's why when he was a publicist he was so entertaining and strange to people because they didn't know what to expect might just uh, change his position from one publication to another uh, and uh, it was very important to him to never have just one stale perspective but right and, and, and generally i think in what we can see in rosanov is that he wanted basically to turn every question upside down and be unexpected and he had to do this because as he himself put it a, a writer's thought had to bore its way into a subject and correspondingly into the reader's soul to to loosen it up and make it more accessible to the widest and most active possible acceptance of the world and it is not hard to notice i believe that the fundamental thrust of rosanov's paradoxes was kind of he was trying to fight cliches and banalities and the world is full of cliches right and uh, in order to get rid of them we have to reach into the soul of man and uh, reach the soul of the world and the cliche it excludes the individual person and cancels out everything that is individual and uh, rosanov he saw the cliche as death and death was always his principal enemy he hated death with a passion which is also one of the reasons why he was so fixated on 
uh, questions of birth and fertility and sex because it was the symbol of life. And Rosanoff was very much pro-life in all senses of the word. And this is where the free segment of our podcast ends. Just admit it, you're hooked and you need to learn more to flex your newly acquired esoteric knowledge on a random art hall that you have a crush on. Free yourself from tedious American monoculture and subscribe to Russians with Attitude. Thank you.